And welcome to our Next Level Summit Fireside Chat. I'm Craig Melvin, today news anchor, co-host of the third hour of today on NBC. I do some stuff on Dateline. I do some stuff at NBC Sports as well. Every two years, the world comes together to watch the greatest athletes on the planet compete for gold. And this July, these larger-than-life competitors will assemble in Paris for the 2024 Summer Olympic Games, bringing all of this coverage to our televisions and our phones and our iPads and our desktops. It's a monumental challenge that requires some of the best leadership in the business. sporting event in the world. Things that just should be impossible tend to happen at the Olympics. It brings together sports, stories, human connections. You get one shot to win your Olympic gold medal. They dedicate so much of their lives for this one moment. You get to see things that are remarkable that kind of bring the world together. Everything is at stake in the Olympics, and I think everybody recognizes it. When you talk about a project this big, you need your leaders to work together. It's production, it's operations, it's technology, it's engineering. We roll into a, a, a city of choice and, and kind of stand up all the infrastructure we need. Everything from power, audio, our camera positions. We've got a list of about 45 athlete profiles, athlete stories that then get inserted in and around our coverage of the sporting events. My job is to help put together the format each night and collect the absolute best content and integrate it into our broadcast then. I am responsible for the actual event coverage, ensuring that we have the proper on-air talent, that we are executing the production. <laughs> Every part of our Olympic group has incredible leadership that all works in a synergistic fashion, and that's a big deal. The obvious challenge uh, to producing an Olympic Games is the volume of content and the sheer hours. There are long days, long nights, long mornings, uh, not a lot of sleep. We're all in our own ways problem solvers. What's possible? How can we get a new angle on that? How can we describe or give context to viewers a little better with technology? The difficulty of the production, the volume of what we do, and there are so many turns in the road, and I am just so blessed and fortunate and thankful that we have a leader like Molly to always guide us down the right road. Molly oversees the, the whole group. She's ex the executive producer of the biggest media event in the world. I'm obsessed with Molly. I don't mind saying it out loud and on camera. Molly makes you believe that you can move mountains and mountain moving is required to produce the Olympics. And I try to make sure that we've got a plan and how we're gonna go about it, but it's ultimately the execution by all the people on the team that determine our success. Part of being uh, a great leader is, is getting a group of people together that are all committed to the same goal and regardless of the hours and the time commitment, they're willing to come back and do it again. I think the most important thing is just making sure everyone on the team knows what is expected of them, knows what goal we're trying to reach together. A great leader takes incredible interest in their team's growth going forward and the ability to bring a team together. We assembled a cast that I think will welcome both sports fans, pop culture fans, news fans. The leadership mantra is to kind of trust in one another and conquer it together. Find that razor thin margin of believing in yourself, but also having that humility and know that you don't know everything and make sure your team knows that you don't know everything. The ability to listen, the ability to communicate clearly, and the ability to be fearless about going forward and accomplishing a task. Sometimes as a leader you feel a little solitary, that no one else can really understand what you're going through. You never make a decision by yourself. So when the going gets tough, I talk to other people. Team USA wins gold! from the excitement of a close finish in a race to telling the incredible stories of the athletes. I hope our audience gets all the feels. You think you know what world class looks like and then you see it in person and it takes your breath away. It's one of the very few things on planet Earth 
that when you're done, you can say, that woman, that man is the best in the world at doing this. Seeing a team come together and execute at a really high level, it's so satisfying. It's such a responsibility to bring that to America, and I love the pressure of that. Wow. And uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, that's a sizzle wheel. That's a sizzle wheel. <laughs> uh, joining me now here in Studio 1A, Molly Solomon, NBC Olympics production executive producer and president, who is, of course, leading the Olympics coverage once again. Daryl Jefferson here as well. Daryl is the senior vice president of engineering and technology for NBC Olympics and NBC Sports. And Lindsay Shanzer as well. Lindsay, uh, NBC Olympics, NBC Sports senior producer. Uh, for, and by the way, we should point out, Molly's busy, Daryl's busy. Lindsay's got the biggest event coming up next, the Kentucky <laughs> Derby. So uh, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, and thank you as well. Those of you who are participating virtually, please drop those questions in the Q&A box to the right of your screen. We'll try to get through as many of those questions throughout this discussion as we can. And before we dig in, we want to give a, a shout out to our partner schools. There you are, University of Texas El Paso, holding a watch party right now. We see you, UT in El Paso. Uh, thank you all so much for being with us. Molly, let me start with you because, again, the Olympics now 100 and what, six, seven days away or something like that? Just, yeah. It's a few days away. You're we leading. keep count. We yeah, keep I count. Know, I know. I know. <laughs> And you're in charge of all of the Olympics. And this is, as you might imagine, um, quite the Herculean effort. How are we looking going into to, to these games in particular? And what are some of the greatest challenges in general when covering something uh, like the Olympics? I think you saw the challenges in that tape. That tape actually got me a little intimidated, but also <laughs> really revved up for about what we're uh, about to go into. You know, the Olympics is the biggest media event in the world. And it only happens every two years and every four years, summer to summer. And we're kind of lucky because the Tokyo Games were postponed a year, which means we only had to wait three years for this next Summer Olympics. So we're going to have a lot of the names that people remember from the last Olympics, like Simone Biles coming back. We're so excited because LeBron James and Steph Curry have yes. thrown their hats in yes. the ring to be on Dream Team 2. Katie Ledecky is poised to become one of the all-time Olympic greats in swimming. So all of these storylines are lining up, and it happens to be in Paris. And I know, Craig, how you probably feel about Paris, like we all do. Oh, yeah. It's an amazing landscape, and what the organizers have done is really take all of the historic landmarks that all of us remember. So the Eiffel Tower is going to be the, at the base of the Eiffel Tower will be beach volleyball. Yeah. All of the marathons are going to finish there. Versailles is going to host equestrian. Like, I think we're poised for a really amazing, amazing Olympics. And, and, and by the way, the opening ceremony just... It, mm. The, the river sand and the float. I mean, that's just... I didn't even get to that, but you're right. <laughs> like, visually, it is, uh, it's going to be uh, quite stunning. Daryl, you're the engineering and technology senior vice president mm -hmm. uh, for, for the Olympics. Uh, for folks who might not be familiar with what exactly that entails, let's start there. What is it uh, that you and, and, and your division does? Basically everything technical, whether it's moving power around a city block or getting the signals home, or connecting each of our, our folks with uh, earpieces or microphones or uh, uh, getting power to lighting, what have you. Uh, it's, it's every piece of technology that, um, that we touch yeah. throughout. Uh, there's a whole army of people that uh, are concerned about all those kind of areas of expertise. Unique challenges in Paris? All unique challenges with every place we go. Okay. Uh, but uh, doing it, um, we, we have uh, a good deal of things in our broadcast center uh, in Paris, but also uh, in the city center of Paris. So doing that away from the, the kind of confines of a, a place made for broadcast yeah. has its own challenges, to be sure. And Lindsay, your, your day job primarily, maybe horse racing, college football, uh, is it a, when you switch over to the Olympics, is, does that require a major shift? Yes and no. So, yes, uh, sorry, no, because it, at least in the case of horse racing and going into the Kentucky Derby, one of the things I love about covering horse racing is it's super rich in terms of storytelling. We have a five hour show and a, effectively a two minute race <laughs> of live action. There's some other races sprinkled in there, but it's really scripted trying to get people familiar with the connections with the horses, telling the stories of the athletes. That's really similar to the Olympics. And the most important thing I think that we do is we get a shot 
every four years to introduce people to these athletes, tell them their stories, give them a rooting interest. So in that regard, it's similar and it's not so much of a change. I would say what the mo the biggest change for me as a producer is, is the Derby is really kind of its own entity. We control basically everything we're doing. The final decision making for the most part comes down to us. I'll co-produce gymnastics at the Olympics and it's just one part of a giant pie. So yeah. it's really figuring out where that fits in the larger scheme of things, playing to the gymnastics audience, but really to you know the primetime audience as a whole and being a piece of that puzzle. One of the things I always enjoy about the Olympics uh, from a coverage standpoint is the ability to pivot when storylines change. Mm -hmm. You know, you go in, you're focused on on these athletes, and all of a sudden someone comes out of nowhere and surprises mm -hmm. the entire country, and you have to shift the focus. Let's talk about, because a lot of the folks who are, are watching and listening right now and who will watch and listen after this, um, when we put it up online, they want to hear about your leadership journey. Like, how, how did you get here? What was it uh, that, that you think contributed the most to you being where you are right now? And, and, and Molly, I'll, I'll start with, with you. Your leadership journey kind of started... Started here, 30 Rock. Yeah. yeah. 34 years ago. Before the internet, Craig, that's how old I am. <laughs> but she started when she was in middle school. <laughs> she was a middle school employee. But it's it's great to, to say you're an NBCU lifer because it is a really wonderful place and they have provided me with so many opportunities. But the leadership journey is different, I think, when you grow up somewhere yes. because as you want to grow, um, you're seen as the person who did the last job. And, and, you know, sometimes you leapfrog colleagues. So it's all, it's kind of complicated, but, you know, it's a really simple recipe. You got to work hard and you've got to enjoy the journey. I, I find so many times, I don't know about you guys, that people want to jump steps, mm -hmm. but the process and doing all the jobs on the way to whatever you aspire to be yeah. makes you better. And patience is really hard when you're 22, 24, 26, but it does require it. It's funny. I was, um, I'm moving right now and I found a journal from my first month at NBC in 19. I don't even remember writing it. And I didn't know how miserable I was because the job was something that I wasn't really good at and wasn't comfortable with, which was talking to people, which is kind of ironic now. But <laughs> I realize now, you know, I took a step back and said, look how far I've come. And I weathered that storm yeah. and I decided to become better at it. And I stuck with it instead of just throwing in the towel you know, six months, a year yeah. in, two years in. So I think to everybody, just know that those first few jobs, those entry level jobs, yeah. they may not be the funnest things, but the, it's a process, it's a journey, and you got to stick with it. I would take it a step further. They usually aren't the mm. funnest yeah. things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, really quickly before we go to Texas Southern, a little birdie told me you actually started at McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. During high school, my parents made me work at McDonald's because I was so shy I wouldn't talk to anybody. So they ended up putting me in the drive through window, which was the safest place. But, but I had to talk to people. Yeah. And look what happened. <laughs> oh, my God. And I, by the way, I've known you for a number of years. I didn't know that until I, until Little Birdie told me. Shockingly. Uh, let us go to Olakule Awe. Olakule Awe there in Texas. Um, Texas Southern. I think you're there, Olakule. There you are. Yeah, thanks, Craig. We are here at Texas Southern University. We are all very excited knowing that the Olympics are 106 days away. One of the students I have with me is Donovan Roy. He has a question for you. What are some of the top challenges your team anticipates ahead of the 2024 Olympics in Paris? Top challenges. That's a good take? question, Daryl. Yeah. Top challenges? Yeah, w one of the things that, uh, a lot of things keep me up at night, but one of the things that really keeps me up at night is, uh, Craig mentioned the opening ceremony. Um, it's the first moving opening ceremony in history. Uh, and it's, it's going up around uh, six, six kilometers up the Seine, passing all of the world, you know, many of the world's um, kind of most uh, memorable and recognizable landmarks. But we've never done that. We've never put teams of, uh, teams of the world's athletes on boats uh, and needed to cover them for a moving course. Uh, it really changes the texture. It really changes our our technical challenges along that way and moving something like a camera signal or uh, a, a microphone signal up a six kilometer course is a really big challenge. And uh, that's one that comes right, right, right to mind. To, to that point there, a quick question. Do you rehearse that? And if you do rehearse that, how? 
Yeah, so we're, I think there are parts of it. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, 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 no. no. We don't want to give up trade secrets here, by the way. Yeah, I think there's parts parts of it that we will rehearse. Okay. um, But there's parts that we would not have rehearsed up until that point. And I think it's part, it's part of the, the thrill of being in live television and, and not knowing what to expect. And if you, if you dream of having a challenging job, uh, this is certainly the job for you. Uh, but I, I think we, we can control, we can control, and we have great partners uh, in the Olympic Broadcasting Service who are also trying to, to cover this moving event. So yeah. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's the, the type of thing that we'll, we'll control, we can control and do the best we can to cover Team USA. All right. And an opening ceremony is going to break out. Yes. Yeah. It's going to happen. It's, it's got to happen. It's got to happen. That's right. Uh, we have a chat question now. I believe this chat question is uh, from uh, Zoe Grossman. This is from Molly and Lindsay. Zoe is asking, how have you navigated advocating for yourself as women in the sports field? Great question, Lindsay. Let me, let me start. I'll start with you. Because you are, for those who may not know this, you're the first woman that sort of run our coverage of the Kentucky Derby. Yeah. Um, yeah, that started. I started producing the Kentucky Derby two years ago. Um, I'm really proud of it. It's, it's uh, you know, a torch I'm honored to care- carry. Um, I've been really lucky at NBC through my career. Uh, I've always been really encouraged. I've never felt very much held back by being a, women, a woman. I know that's not always been the case in this industry, so I feel very luck- lucky and grateful for the people I have around me. I've always always had Molly out there as, as a leader to look up to in her position, and I'm very lucky that she's running the Olympics now as someone to continue to have as a mentor. Um, But I think, you know, it's not just advocating for yourself as a woman in your position, particularly when you get to a position of leadership, it's having women around you. So it's filling the teams that you have with women, not exclusively, of course, best people for the job, but it's knowing that you have different perspectives. Um, And in the Kentucky Derby, we have a lot of women on the team. And that, by the way, I think makes a lot of sense because our viewership for the Kentucky Derby, much like it is for the Olympics, is really split. It's really split from a gender perspective, and that's rare in sports TV coverage, but um, I think it makes a lot of sense to have uh, those different faces as part of the production team when that's the audience you have. Yeah. Molly, you, I mean, you know, you, you came along um, at, a, at a different time. Mm-hmm. I, I would imagine it mm-hmm. wasn't always easy for Molly Solomon to be at a table or in a room where you were probably sometimes the only woman. Mm-hmm. How, how, how do you navigate that? How did you navigate that? I didn't think about it. And it sounds crazy because there were only three other women that worked at NBC Sports, the entire department wow. when I joined. And so if you think about it, how does it help you get where you want to go? So I, I love sports television and I had mentors and, and sponsors like in the chairman, Dick Ebersol, who put me in rooms when I was shouldn't have been even in rooms and I could listen and learn. And so I think more than anything, I didn't have to do anything except do my job, which is a credit to everybody around me, that there were no barriers, no gender obstacles. And then they gave you, they, he gave me opportunities that were beyond my wildest dreams. And he actually pushed me to places when I wasn't comfortable. He said, no, you're going to produce live figure skating at the Vancouver Olympics. I was like, what? what, what? I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a studio producer. And he goes, no, this is important. So I think the, the lesson is that you've got to surround yourself or find mentors and yeah. sponsors that will advocate for you. But I think right now it, we're just in such a great space in sports television that increasing numbers of women, increasing women, increasing numbers of women in senior positions like Lindsay, and it's all about role modeling, right? If you see it, you can be it, the old adage. So um, I just think now the doors are open for everybody to just do their job, and I think that's what we wanted all along, just the opportunity to do our job. Um, I think we've got the University of Florida ready. We're going to go down to Gator Country here. We've got a student standing by with our student correspondent, Reagan Shepard. Reagan, good to see you. Hello, and welcome back to our fabulous Atlas Lab here at the University of Florida. I'm here with first-year student Anya Schwartzbauer, studying international studies in journalism. And Anya has a question for you all. Hi, everyone. Uh, My question is, what advice do you have for incoming NBCU interns in the Olympics and just in general when it comes to building leadership skills whilst learning from the bottom up? Good question. Good question. question. Who wants to tackle that one first? Oh, look at that, Daryl. Looks like you... (laughs) Looks, looks like you raised your hand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think, uh, Molly mentioned it earlier, um, every position that you have um, 
just work as hard as you can and say yes to as many things as you can take. Um, it's not just showing your willingness to pitch in, but it also might expose you to something that you fall in love with, right? Uh, I, I think half the, the thing in, in many jobs, but particularly in the entertainment industry, is learning that these jobs exist, learning that this path exists. And so many of the parts of my job that I have now weren't even a thing. To, to Molly's mm -hmm. point, uh, there's a lot of technology that didn't exist that I now oversee. Uh, so being open to those things, being uh, available to those things and saying yes as, as often as you can. Um, and and it, it'll give you exposure and, and give you kind of new doorways and pathways that you might not get exposed to otherwise. It, did you? Yeah, I would say the value of internships too isn't, isn't the task that you've been given, but it's observing, to Daryl's point, all the other jobs around you and say, oh wait, programming, what's that? Maybe yep. I'm interested in that. So you may be logging track and field, but just keep your eyes open and look around because yep. you may see something you wanna pursue. So I would say be observant. And ask um, questions. I started uh, starting the business as a photographer. That was my first. You did? I, I, was, I was terrible. Which is <laughs> why I ended up on the other side of the camera. True story. We won't yeah. get into that right now because <laughs> we're trying to inspire and encourage. Uh, but we do have another pre-submitted question. This one comes from Natalie Costanz at the California State University, Northridge. Uh, Natalie is asking, what qualities in a leader do you look for? And how can we improve ourselves to not only have those qualities, but share them with others. Oh, Lindsay raised her hand. <laughs> Two hands up. Sure. Uh, I, this is my personal feeling, but um, I think the most important qualities in a leader that I've observed are creating an environment of collaboration, encouraging the people around you to be creative, have ideas, and be part of that idea-making process, and trusting those people. When you give them assignments, let them do it. Micromanagement can be a real problem, and I think it's counterproductive across the board. So I think great leaders are those who invite collaboration, um, don't create an environment of fear or intimidation. So, you know, make your teams feel free to be creative and get yeah. those ideas out there and not be afraid to fail or be rejected. Um, I think that's hugely important, particularly in our business. And like I said, just let people fly. And if they fail a little bit, be there to catch them. But if you're a good leader, you've put them in the best position to succeed. Molly, I, I, I would venture to say you'd be hard pressed to find an example where collaboration or teamwork is more essential than, than, than running the Olympics, especially. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk to us a little bit about why why is it that teamwork makes the dream work, as they say? Well, when you look across this desk, I couldn't do my job without everything that Daryl's doing. We talk a number of times a day, so it is interlocking and and all of our success is intertwined. So yeah. it just it's almost like you don't think about it, but it is so in, integral to trust people, as Lindsay's talking about, to have trust in the, in the people you work with. And we're so lucky at NBC Sports Olympics because it is the top of the you know, the mountain in terms of everybody's um, qualities and also what they know, it's an all-star team. Yes. So in a lot of ways, we're, we're working on an all-star team. I think the other thing that's key about leadership is that it's not about being in charge. Horizontal leaders are the most influential in any organization, right? Because you're doing your job and you're respected by people over here, over here. So just think about doing your job the best and it will... I think ultimately it will be, it will shine, people will notice, but it's not always about the title yeah. and the job. I always looked to try to be a horizontal leader, meaning that I could be impactful in different ways in different departments. You should write a book. Anyone ever tell you that? No. You should write a book. No? I, okay. I mean, as if you have so much free time. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe one day. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to Texas Southern uh, University. Uh, Ola Kunle Awe is, is back, our student reporter standing by with another question. Hey there. And by the way, Ola Kunle, am I, am I pronouncing it correctly? Oh, yes, Greg. You're saying it correctly. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. You're so, yes, we do have another, we have another question. We have Jalen Rogers with a question for you. Hi there. Um, there's expected to be a lot of foot traffic in Paris due to the Olympics, with an expected 600,000 attendees packing out the arena. With that being said, what are some logistical, operational, and safety considerations in covering the 2024 Olympics? Oh, I think we know who's I, answering that. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I can. I, go for we, it. we can. You tag. We'll yeah, tag. I, I, was, I was going to say, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great concern, and it's a great question. I, I think security is the, the most paramount thing. 
uh, making sure both uh, the folks we work with and all the spectators and the athletes are, are kept safe. Uh, the, the city of Paris and the organizing committee are organizing a small army to secure the area, to, to be sure. Uh, but logistics uh, will also be really difficult for that very reason. To be safe, uh, there'll be lots of security perimeters and uh, lots of identification that you need to, to show to get into different areas. So uh, doing things like moving equipment around or moving cable around, which is what I think about a lot, uh, that will be challenging without a doubt uh, because it's out in the open, because it's uh, the city of Paris, but it's, uh, it's also, it's the city of Paris. Yeah. So we, we get to do it. Yes. Uh, but Molly, you're going to say something. Well, it's always interesting because every Olympic city kind of has its own challenges. Mm -hmm. So when you go to a city like Paris, imagine shutting down the streets. If you guys know the, the traffic in Paris. So they do things like um, they have Olympic lanes. So if it's a four lane road, one of the lane is just reserved for Olympic traffic. So they do try to make it easier for us. And they kind of count on people going on vacation during the Olympics and subletting their yeah, houses. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think our, our colleagues in the operations department, every Olympics have the greatest, greatest challenge is getting us places on time and safely. And yeah, and you guys always seem to pull it off without a hitch. I, here's one thing we haven't talked about: mm -hmm. the weather. I mean, we, how do you? It's fact, gonna be sunny the whole, the whole time. time. <laughs> Two weeks of sun. Two <laughs> weeks of sun. You know what keeps me up at night? Is weather. It's gonna rain on July 26th, the night Correct. of the opening ceremony, because it's open air. Yeah. So. Yeah. There'll be no rain. No rain. Yeah. We're calling no, it no, no rain. rain at all. Uh, we've got a chat question here. This is Audrey Taylor. She's in the chat. Uh, Audrey is asking, how do you stay level-headed as a leader uh, during such a fast-paced and overwhelming event like the Olympics? That's a really good question mm -hmm. because I have noticed that. That's, that's a, a common thread that I've, I've seen up close with pretty much everyone who works in sports. Can all, yeah, I mean, Molly's like, you haven't come into the control room right now. No, you all seem to be pretty really? even tempered. Yes. You should see us when we're not talking in your ear. Oh, okay, <laughs> got it, got it. But I mean, how, how do you maintain that? I, I, because we work for this moment. Yeah. We work for this moment, and we are as excited as the athletes to put on the Olympics. But I think it comes from a, a place of gratitude. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm so lucky. And sometimes you'll say, oh, you never say you're lucky about what you get to do. Heck yes. Yeah. I'm lucky, I'm proud, I'm happy, and I love to share it with the team. Like, I get sad when it's over after 17 mm -hmm. days because there's this feeling of, of adrenaline and momentum, and we're doing something that no one else is doing and everyone's talking about it, and then it's over. Right. Boom. Hmm. right. And then we miss it, and it happens 18 months later. How about you, Lindsay? Is there, I mean, when you're... It's, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, and the short answer is I have no idea. It's just, <laughs> I really don't. It's She's the honest. truth. It's like, you know, and somehow I walk away, and I'm like, oh, I guess I was relatively calm, cool, and collected there when everything is burning up in front of me. But, um, you know, I guess by the time you make it to this level, you must have been fairly good at that, or else you wouldn't be in this position. So, yeah, some of it is just you let the natural, you know, nature take over and do its thing, but I think a lot of it is preparation. It's just, you get yourself to the point where you know what you're doing, you're ready for it, you've thought about the different circumstances, different things that can happen. You certainly can't plan for everything. I've been in countless situations where something surprising happens, um, but you get yourself to as, you know, as prepared as you possibly can be for things to happen, and you let that take over, like in any job, you know. Hey, one of you said something earlier, I think, that also uh, rings true. When you are surrounded by you know, other folks who are pretty doggone good at what they do. It helps to sort of maintain mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 an even temper. Uh, we have an audience question. This is our first question from our audience at CNBC. We see you, Inglewood Cliffs. Uh, hey there. Hi. Give us Give us your name and then your school and your question. Hello there, my name is Aurelis Ortega and I come from Borough of Manhattan Community College. And my question for you is, what is the most inspiring part about covering the Olympics and how does it motivate you in your career? Oh, that's a good Ooh, question. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I we'll come to you guys in a second, but I will tell you, having done a few of these, it's gonna sound s small and cheesy, but even on this show, anytime I hear the, the music, like you, oh, yeah. like you hear the music, oh, it's, <laughs> it's time, it's go time. Yeah. And if yeah. you think about it, there are very few theme songs left that really sort of evoke any sort of emotion or excitement at, at that level, in my opinion. Now, for me, it's just, as small as it may sound, it's just the, the song itself. But yeah. for you guys. 
Yeah. You want me to answer? I kind of answered. Uh, I think what it is is that it's so unique. The Olympics is unique. And I've worked golf. I've, I've worked major championships, Super Bowls, NBA finals, you, whatever. But when I tell people I work on the Olympics, they yeah. lean in mm -hmm. and they want to know. So there's such a, there's a cool sense. The, the way America views the Olympics is that it's special. So for us to be able to do it, and I think there's something too, it doesn't happen every week. Yes. It happens every two years and that scarcity almost builds anticipation. And so we get just as excited. Like when they light that cauldron, I cry every time. Mm -hmm. I'm in the truck crying. It's yeah. so ridiculous. When it, when it gets extinguished, I cry. But I'm not embarrassed about it because it's a meaningful time and there's nothing like the world coming together. And and 800 athletes competing for Team USA. That patriotism and, and, and they've worked for this moment and we get to bring it to the audience. It's a pretty privileged position yes. I think we're in. Yes, it is. Speaking yeah. of the cauldron, do you want to break news and just tell us? <laughs> no who's... idea. And I love it. That <laughs> really? Yes, I like okay. to be surprised. All right. Did you guys want to take that question as yeah, well? I, I was going to say, like... It's also the world in, in many, many times really needs something to cheer for, yes. right? Um, that feels that way right now. Um, and that we get to bring that and deliver that to uh, the country mm -hmm. is humbling, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that we get to kind of put, put items, not that we pause all the grim things that are happening, but you get to focus on something and cheer as a country um, and it's, it's pretty amazing to be a part of that. I don't remember who said it years ago, but someone uh, pointed out that it perhaps isn't coincidence that uh, the Olympic Games uh, always happen in, in years where there's an election as well. <laughs> and right between the two conventions. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. So, right. Not sure how that happened, but we're thankful for it. Indeed. Uh, let us now go to Texas Southern University. We're going to go back to Texas Southern. Again, this is uh, Olukunle Awe, our student reporter, standing by with another great question. What, who do you have now? Thanks once again, Craig. This time we have freshman Kaylin Pomone with another question. Hello, what are you doing differently this year to prepare for coverage in the 2024 Olympics in Paris versus 2020? Good question. You've got some good questions coming yeah. from these students here. Yeah. Uh, different preparations besides the yeah. floating, you know. Well, what's fascinating about Olympics, and it's like it's like putting together a puzzle. You take the time zone, and that happens to be six hours ahead of the United States, and then you build around it. So what it means and I can break some news here with you. Oh. So it means all day on NBC, we're gonna have live events. And one of our anchors is Mr. Craig Melvin. Uh, we'll be anchoring on NBC. Um, so we're using the time zone to make sure that we're bringing this to as many people as possible. So we're gonna have some really cool stuff. We're gonna be live on NBC with uh, gymnastics, swimming, track finals all during the day. We're actually um, gonna, create an Olympic gold zone, which I don't know if I have any That's NFL idea. fans That's out there. Idea. We are going to copy NFL red zone and we're going to zip from one event to the other on Peacock, which is going to be great. So you can really never miss a moment, never miss a medal. Um, so we've got all these different opportunities, but then the challenge comes in prime time. And so prime time is um, from eight to 11 each night. And that's where the majority of America watches the Olympics. I think it's almost 70%. But imagine eight o'clock at night is two o'clock in the morning Paris time, so everything's happened. So the biggest challenge, but I think the biggest opportunity is to take prime time and we're going to treat it like a sports entertainment show. It's gonna be called Prime Time in Paris and we're gonna give you the best of the best in those three hours. So you may have seen it in the afternoon, but do you know what really happened? Yeah. And so I'm gonna throw it to Lindsay because Lindsay is um, co-producing out at gymnastics so she can kind of talk about how we're going to enhance and make the nighttime different than the daytime. Yeah, so with gymnastics, as an example, live coverage is really um, jam-packed event to event to event. There's barely any time in between uh, athletes competing to um, enhance with storytelling technology, which is especially what we're going to lean into technology, give you an understanding of exactly what you're seeing and how hard it is to do these things these athletes are doing. Um, really break that down. We've got uh, some correspondents who are specific to that that plan. We've got what we call live view teams, um, different cameras sort of deployed out across the venue and across Paris to get more uh, up close and personal moments with the athletes' families, their friends, 
give you the behind the scenes um, to enhance those stories of where they're coming from and the reactions around them. So you may have seen it in the afternoon, yeah. but what you're going to see at night is going to look a little different and give you a bigger, more comprehensive picture of everything that's going into that moment. One of the things that, that really, I thought, enhanced the coverage, granted it was a function of the pandemic primarily, but those watch parties mm -hmm. where you'd see like this kid you'd never seen before and 200 of his closest friends watching in Anchorage, Alaska, yeah. Yeah. like going crazy. Are you guys, yeah. are we bringing the watch parties back? Yeah, we, we have a good deal of watch parties, a lot more backstage access, kind of behind the scenes coverage. We're doing those, uh, and they'll also be, because more people will be in the country, they'll also be uh, kind of a, a party zone at Team USA House as well. So we'll have, there'll, there'll be more opportunities both in country and throughout uh, the U.S. as well. Party zone. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's I, where Snoop I, is going to be hosting. Yeah, clearly. We didn't even say Snoop. We're 45 minutes in and we and haven't I, said Snoop yet. <laughs> I, no, that was not, not just the Snoop. Over. Snoop and who else is going to be there? Snoop, Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning, Kelly Clarkson, Jimmy Fallon, Alex Cooper, the podcaster, is joining our wow. team. Yeah. All right. A lot of new voices. Uh, we've got a question from the chat here. This is Ethan Ferguson, I believe. Ethan Ethan's asking, uh, in sports storytelling, and especially at the Olympics, the content often provides information about the athlete's life outside the sport. What are some techniques you have for finding the story within the story? That's a good question. That's a really good question. question. We are the very, we are a very proud unit of storytellers, but behind every story, you have to find the information behind it. And Craig, I think you've experienced the Olympic Research Group. Oh. We employ dozens of people that talk to athletes firsthand, their families, to find those little kernels mm -hmm. I think he's talking about. Um, and so we do the homework in order to tell the stories. I've also, um, we're really focusing also on techniques and storytelling in that I think we all increasingly, you know, look at Instagram and TikTok for storytelling. And so how do we take some of the best of that that people are experiencing and mix it in with, um, you know, traditional storytelling methods? I'll give you one example. There's a, there's a swimmer from um, New Jersey or Westchester, and every time she won a race as a kid, she got a rubber ducky. So it turns out this woman has a hundred rubber duckies in her bedroom. Wow. So like that little slice of her life yeah. is memorable. Yes. We don't have to necessarily tell the whole story, you know, birth to what, how she got to Paris, but let's tell the story behind the rubber duckies. Yeah. And that's kind of how we're now experiencing storytelling in our everyday life. But I, I think there's something really valuable in capturing moments that people are going to remember and then root for that athlete. Well, now I'm rooting for Rubber Ducky rubber woman. Ducky. I, I don't Douglas know who she <laughs> is, but I am rooting for Rubber Ducky. I'm going to send it to you. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the University of Florida. We've got a student standing by with our student correspondent, Reagan Shepard, once again. Hey, Reagan. Hey, guys. Thank you again. I'm here with second year student Gabriel Velasquez Neta studying journalism, and here is his question. Yeah, do you guys have any tips on how to break into the industry as a photojournalist? Question. For you. Breaking yeah. into the industry as a photojournalist specifically. Yeah, I, I think uh, again, getting getting your signing up to a team where you have the opportunity to uh, number one show what you have uh, and give a little perspective and a different look uh, at something. I think so much of what we're talking about in terms of storytelling and telling the, the story behind the story, that type of thing. Uh, comes down to capturing the image that people won't forget, like a backstage camera with Michael Phelps gearing himself up in a warm-up room, or uh, a, uh, a behind-the-scenes uh, uh, footage of someone at the start gate of, of an al alpine skier kind of gearing themselves up, and you see the kind of process or the mantra or whatever that athlete's uh, key to success is, and finding a way for you as a photojournalist to not only see and recognize that moment as a moment, but capturing it uh, and kind of giving it the kind of loft it deserves. Uh, so I, I think breaking into that uh, is kind of aligning with a team that kind of aligns with your aesthetic uh, and what you like to cover, um, whether it's sports coverage or uh, news coverage or that type of thing. Uh, making sure that the, the kind of style that you like to shoot with 
uh, kind of aligns with, with what the goal of that property is. Well, we've got about five minutes left, and we've got one more audience question there. But before that, I, I can't believe I'm just thinking about this now. Mm -hmm. Drones. One of, mm -hmm. one of my favorite parts of the last game, I think it was the last games, maybe even the one before that, there were, it seemed as if we were using more drones. Yeah. We, we, we drones are coming back. Yeah, they are. <laughs> more drones. I mean, the, some, some of the challenge is uh, Paris is a, a highly densely populated area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So getting clearance for those drones, and uh, it's, it's, it will be a challenge, but there certainly will be drones. You think about Versailles, there's no way to give a size and scope of Versailles without seeing the whole thing. Correct. So we'll, we'll, we, we will fly, and certainly the, the Olympic Broadcasting Service will fly drones, to be sure, along with helicopters and other yeah. aerial coverage uh, to give the size and scope and kind of the layout of the city. And just from a logistical standpoint, once again, I don't think a lot of folks fully appreciate all of the games aren't happening in, in, in Paris proper. I mean, no. Tahiti is home to... Surfing. Surfing. <laughs> correct, correct. Is that where the head, is that where Daryl's headquarters yeah. is? Tahiti, <laughs> yeah, that, I applied for that. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's I'm still waiting. Uh, yeah, th there's, in, in, on top of things being kind of centrally located, there are things out in the outskirts. The basketball venue for basketball prelims is in Lille, uh, outside of the city. Uh, Tahiti, of course, and there are a, a number of other venues outside that some of the football or soccer venues are spread out as well. Uh, it kind of brings the joy of the games and kind of the experience to more of the country. That's a good point. So that's mm -hmm. that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, it also gives a little breathing room to someone who's trying to get cross town. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> two, two pros. Let's get to that audience question, CNBC. Uh, hey there, once again, give us your name. And, and your school before the question. Hi, I'm Jennifer Sanchez from Montclair State University. So my question is, what is the planning process in regards to production and strategies to cover all possible games? How long does it take? Oh, that sounds like a Molly that's question. A uh, you know, we're always planning two Olympics at a time. Because when you think about it, we're going to get off the air in Paris, and it's only 18 months until the next games. So we're always planning a summer and a winter. And actually, we're getting a head start on LA 28. So technically, we're planning three Olympics at a time. But um, you know, I think it, we have to point out the institutional knowledge that our group has. We've been doing the Olympics since 1988. So we really have um, at least a base plan. And because we have a base plan, and Lindsay talked to preparation being you know, the key to all of this, if you have a base plan, then you can innovate on top of it. But when we throw some of the numbers at you, we're going to have 3,000 people working for us at, during the Olympics, <laughs> one of them. Uh, and so 1,000 people will be in Paris, but 2,000 people are going to be in our Stanford headquarters. Wow. So um, we have state-of-the-art technology. Daryl runs that facility, so we'll be ready. But I think it all begins with a really detailed plan. If you have a detailed plan, then you're ready to freelance and react to everything that happens. But it's a logistical, operational production. It, well, like we say, it's a Super Bowl every day for 17 days. This it's crazy. Great. And this we, we started building stuff yeah. for the Olympics in April of 2023. We started installing gear that was headed to the Olympics. So that gives you an idea. That means the design cycle happens before that. The mm -hmm. original idea happens before that. And it's long gone and on the water headed to Paris right now. So it's, it's a lengthy process, to your point, uh, that, that takes a while. And uh, we think about pretty much all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have jobs. <laughs> this, this has been great. And speaking of jobs, we're going to let you guys get back to your full-time day jobs. This has been uh, quite the treat. I, I actually learned a whole lot as well. So um, I hope all of you who are watching right now learn something as well. Thank you so much. Uh, for being here with us. That is all the time that I have today.